Hello everyone, this is going to be the first episode that includes cosmology and a little bit of quantum physics, but mostly referential. Um, I've been interested in cosmology from a very young age, and I think that it's um, very, very important to philosophy and all that and not incorporated enough. And so I think that it is important to understand it without having to know any of the actual math none of the actual math i whenever i see an equation i just skip ahead to what they're actually talking about because the math is for actually doing it and making new discoveries you can think of the math as kind of like you can be a football fan or basketball fan and understand the game just fine while having no idea how to actually play it and no idea to actually no ability to actually make a free throw and maybe you don't even know like batting form but you know baseball you don't know all the techniques but you know the game and what they're doing that's what you can achieve so i think that in a lot of ways i'm, I'm going to be talking about this thing called the Fermi Paradox, which is the name for the fact that we're alone in the universe, seemingly, right? We don't have any signs of intelligent alien life. And the entire, the entire point of that, or well, the problem with it is that it seems like, okay, space, we'll, we'll just talk about the Milky Way, just the Milky Way, our galaxy. It's impossibly big and impossibly vast, right? Even getting to the newest, the nearest star would take us thousands and thousands of years. But it's also that vast with that many stars, and it's been around for that long, much longer. So despite its vastness, by now there should have been intelligent species kind of expanding and rising up, star-faring intelligent alien life unless for whatever reason we're just that special or there's this thing called the great filter and you can watch all kinds of youtube videos about the great filter and this and that and all of the great filter discussions that you find amongst scientists are based on materialism like trying to prove that it's because we are eukaryotes and there aren't any other eukaryotes trying to prove that intelligent species end up nuking each other and that we're about to. All kinds of explanations when sometimes I feel like there isn't that much thinking outside the box or cross-referencing because as far as I understand, we've already proven with, with almost near certainty that this universe is in fact a simulation and artificial. So we can, we kind of, already have if you watch silicon valley the comedy show they talk about how they they have a scene where like the secular people are making fun of the religious people for believing in an observer and then they say oh well um you know well we believe this is a simulation but it's not as dumb as you believing in an observer because we've proven that there's an observer <sighs> okay well yeah, it's not that hard to prove. Honestly, there's a million different ways to prove it. And mathematics is just one of the newest ones. Because if you really think about it, like, what if, as we've already proven with math, this entire thing is an experiment? Would you want a controlled study or not? I would want a controlled study. I wouldn't want... As soon as the species enters the information era, it's flooded. We already can't even handle being flooded with our own bullshit. Imagine if it was just all alien bullshit. You would want a controlled study. So the thing is, I don't know. I have no idea. It's possible that this isn't a simulation at all. But, but think about statistics. Like We're trying to figure out why, even though it seems probable there should be aliens everywhere, there aren't. So speaking in the context of probability, it's possible that it's simply because it was designed that way as a controlled study. So who knows? Maybe there's alien species on every single star in the galaxy. And as soon as you send anything out into interstellar space, it just gets blocked or something. Who knows? I don't know. 
And then the simulation just kind of ends as soon as the species gets like spreads around its solar system. And they're trying to figure out how to predict when a species is going to become spacefaring or not. That would be useful information. Imagine you have a hundred different planets with semi-intelligent monkeys like us on them, and you're trying to figure out which ones are going to spread across the galaxy. What would you do? You would simulate a million and a half controlled studies. That's what I would do at least. So it's like we don't have to talk about we don't have to talk about all the science because it's like we're talking about probabilities. So we we have we have probabilities from pure mathematics and also you know a lot of quantum physicists quantum physicists don't believe things, but you can mathematically represent this universe as a 2D hologram. So I find it really interesting that you don't even necessarily need to create something out of um I mean there's so many different ways that that are beyond our imagination to create a simulated universe. Um if you want to know what they mean by this universe being a hologram, this universe being a 2D hologram, it's very interesting and I incorporated a lot into my sci-fi. PBS Space Time has videos on it. All this stuff, guys, all this stuff is from PBS Space Time. That's it. It's all you have to watch. It didn't used to exist, so I would read a lot of Stephen Hawking. I would keep up with a lot of uh, blogs and news science articles. But now the physicists themselves just go on YouTube. And what do you know? They don't talk about math. They talk about the game. They talk about the whole thing. They talk about how insane it all is. You can't think of the Big Bang as the beginning. The Big Bang means very little. It just means that everything started suddenly expanding. That's it. So you talk about before the Big Bang, it's like, we don't even, the Big Bang isn't even the beginning. We already know that. So it's like, you can't, you can't take the pop science interpretation of everything. You can listen to the physicists themselves now. And they'll be like, the Big Bang, dude, I barely even care about it anymore. Because we're just trying to figure out why it started inflating in the first place. What was the field that gave birth to the field that is, that we now call quantum space time? Why did it happen? I don't know. There's a million reasons. They think that, you know, there's theories, everything. It could have had no beginning at all. It's possible that it's always existed. It's like a closed loop of time, if you will. And the passage of time is something that's kind of emulated and simulated. And I can talk about how that would be important for some kind of experiment, too. Everything that seems so weird, everything that seems like we shouldn't belong here. It's like the Truman Show. Things that don't make sense are usually clues as to what the whole point was, in my opinion. But I don't believe any of this stuff. I just think it's the most likely thing that I've been exposed to based on the figures and metrics and proofs that I've looked at. Because everything from eukaryotic cells to this and that, there's just too many stars. I'm sorry. And I didn't used to think that, but after I started writing sci-fi and really trying to write galaxy-spanning space opera... Even in just the Milky Way, there's just too many stars. It's really weird that we're alone. It's been around for too long and there's too many stars. So whenever you think something weird's going on, okay, what's the least weird explanation? Occam's razor. The least weird explanation is that it was just designed this way. Makes sense. So, you know, I also think that you know, I, I take care of birds and, and I used to have a chameleon and stuff. And like, we can't know our observer, just like how your pet can't understand. It's like, why are we trying to understand why we get, you know, it's like your, your, your dog trying to understand why it gets taken to the vet. You'll never understand. You, you just can't. We can observe that the entities below us have limits, but then we don't think we have our limits. Why do we try? I think that what we need to try is to figure for our own grounding to figure out what we want to do with our lives. But I think that trying to know the observer, trying to know why the simulation's here or what it is or if it is a simulation, we're never going to. It's just like we already know that there's a hard limit on what we can verify through observation and experiment, namely pretty much everything after the Big Bang. And we already have 
we can look at clues from the cosmic mic from the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, which is just the remnants of the microwave era of the the microwave inflation era or something that it's called. Um, it's like I think it's from a couple hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, if I remember correctly. So very very early universe. And by looking at it and its distribution, we can kind of get some clues. And also by looking at giant structures in space, the way matter is distributed, we can get some clues. Like, why is there no antimatter? I don't know. Maybe the maybe the place housing this simulation has stuff getting. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't have matter. I don't know. <sighs> so you know. You can kind of just start to think weirdly and outside the box a little bit. So this was just an episode kind of demonstrating that. And I want to make it very clear. I'm not trying to make like, you know, positive claims about reality. I'm just trying to demonstrate that there's other ways of looking at things. Always. That's what this channel is about. How to confront the challenges of feeling like we don't belong. So this is only an 11 minute episode and that's good as an introduction to cosmology and quantum physics. Um, just listen to the physicists themselves. They don't talk about math because they know it's like if you're trying to tell somebody something that you're passionate about, do you go into all the details? If I'm trying to tell somebody about Martin Heidegger, I don't start talking about ancient Greek because it would be like it just doesn't work. You have to make, but it's like the only reason why I care is because it's relevant. The only reason why they care is because it's relevant. If it wasn't relevant to, to anything and it was just numbers, they, they wouldn't care as much. You know? That's, uh, by the way, that's like pure Heidegger, believe it or not. <laughs> so I know that I think about it. They only care because it's relevant. That's the only time we really care about anything even if we don't always realize, especially over significant time scales. So I'm going to go into what science is and why science is and why people think there's a secular religious divide when there isn't. There's a secular old religion divide, but there's not a secular spiritual divide at all. There's no such thing. I mean, if you, if you think that quantum physics and cosmology harms spiritualism please listen to quantum physicists and cosmologists please it's like why not listen to the people who actually do it you know instead of third parties so yeah and we can now the information era that's why technology is holy so yeah thank you everybody i guess that that's good enough for now um don't know what else really to say for this episode other than we're going to go into this channel will have a lot of news coming from quantum physicists and um cosmologists because um, well and quantum cosmologists <laughs> i would say you have to understand too that quantum physics is not that scary guys all quantum physics means the only thing that quantum means is that they are trying to emulate reality using the smallest building blocks possible namely at the Planck scale but they can't do that yet they have to go there's there's another thing called the gut scale the grand unified theory scale and then there's also the scale that the large hadron collider is able to work at you need energy levels to be able to observe smaller and smaller and smaller and break reality at smaller and smaller and smaller increments. Um, or break matter and break subatomic particles and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's like if you're bashing two rocks together, how small are the shards? It's not like that at all, actually. It's because of how much energy you need to make the observation. It's all about the observation, guys. Like the Schrodinger interpretation, the whole Schrodinger's cat stuff. It's all just, it's all... <sighs> You have to understand, it's all just because they're trying to take measurements. It's all because they're trying to observe. That's what messes things up and makes things weird, just like our universe with an observer, maybe. Probably. Probably. It's not maybe, it's probably. If they prove it with math, it's now probably. You don't get to just ignore it. You know? 
It is probably a simulation. If we think it's not a simulation, we have to prove it. The burden of proof is on the on the side without the probability on its side. Anyway, I think I've gone on long enough. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate listening. And yeah, it just shows how philosophy and science, philosophers need to study science. They need to understand it. I feel like I can't call myself a philosopher because I don't understand science enough. And how can you be wise if you don't know science? Science is all about predicting the future and understanding the past. You need to understand it. It's the only, you just have to. And, you know, so I think that to be a philosopher, it would make sense to have to have a PhD in like a diverse array of fields. Because philosophy is just a love of wisdom. Well, geez, there's wisdom everywhere, you know. So logic games, like most philo- most people who call themselves philosophers right now are logicians. And they do what's called analytic philosophy. But that's a subclass of philosophy. And so is science. So why are they calling themselves philosophers if scientists don't? Just call themselves logicians. It's a subclass. And if you don't believe me, listen to Quine, an analytic philosopher. He proved it. And they ignore him, in my opinion. We kind of ignore truths that are uncomfortable. You know, that's that, that's talked about by philosophers as well, is that we prove it's a simulation that's uncomfortable. So we just ignore it and start acting like this is all real again and that we're not being watched and that we're not pets and that we're not in a, you know, it's like, but we are pets. We already know. You don't like thinking of yourself as a pet. But if you look at our pets, they're not that bad. I mean, my birds are OK. But we still die and we still suffer and things aren't fair. Probably because we're lab rats. <laughs> what do we do to lab rats? Most of them, you know, or most of them end up kind of all right, but some of them get really horrible experiences for the sake of the controlled study. You know, some of them. Things start. I don't know, man, the more you think about it, it's and the more you look at the math and the more you look at the logic, it's like, oh, man, you know, it look it starts to look pretty, pretty legit. But then you realize that it doesn't have to you don't have to care. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're trapped in reality just like we are. And they're probably themselves in the simulation. It's probably simulations, thousands, millions, infinite times up because time like <laughs> time's always been there. If 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 existence and being are infinite and there's infinite universes, that means that there's infinite simulations and everybody is in one, basically, except for like the very, 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 very first, which would be like, you know, the odds of being that would be thousands and thousands. But it's possible that this is the only universe and that this is the only reality and that there's no such thing and that there was never a beginning and that everything is just. But if it goes on forever the problem is that it, even if the universe, even if this universe is all there is, because we can see about, I think, 46 billion light years in a sphere because space expands. So we can see farther than the light has had time to travel it, or it would have had time to travel. But if the universe is completely infinite, that means that every possible combination of atoms exists an infinite amount of times, including us. So suddenly you arrive at like reincarnation and all kinds of weird stuff like the eternal return where everything is cyclical and goes on an infinite amount of times because if space is infinite that means that we exist an infinite amount of times in an infinite amount of places it's just somewhere else it's just way over there or something it's not literally us though it's like a star trek teleporter where you get you know it's 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 a reconstruction and every little variation so You can kind of believe in like a weird, like a multiverse of sorts that everything happens, but only within the laws of our physics. And it's only because the universe is just so vast that every possible combination of happenings happens somewhere. Anyway, I'll stop here. We're coming up on 20 minutes, which is my target length for episodes. I hope it was kind of cool. You learned something about why I care about science so much and why it's so important, even though I don't... um, bother with the math because the math is crazy i mean it's worth learning superposition um like nom um god what's the word like like the way that they do the um nomenclature i think it's called um just how they do the uh the symbols and all that because 
it, it just helps you kind of understand what they're talking about because superposition becomes easier to understand when you understand that they're they're trying to take a measurement. So you just think of it in that utility context, and it's a lot easier to understand Schrodinger's cat and stuff. You don't have to think about what reality actually is, because we don't know. We can't know. We can't get below the Planck scale or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The point is that we are building our prediction of it. That's why Schrodinger's cat is there. You don't have to worry about quote-unquote fundamental reality. You have to worry about how it appears to us. Schrodinger's cat is how it appears. We don't know how it actually is. We'll never know. It could be so weird. We don't even know. But we know that things normalize later. In the, on the on larger scales, things normalize and become predictable and consistent. We know that. I mean, you can, you know, you can just drop a rock somewhere if you don't believe that. So the only thing, it seems like the only thing that exists far, 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 far down is chaos of sorts. But then, you know, you get massive structures and that's, I can talk about how that works. There's this thing called constructor theory that's kind of illustrating it, but it, but it, um, it's like a different way of modeling the universe, a non-perturbative model. So, you know, it's all about how you can get very complex outcomes from simple rules. Anyway, I'll stop here. Thanks, everybody. Go ahead and upload this episode and uh, that, that'll be it. Thanks.